Tonight, I can report to the American people and to the world that the United States has conducted an operation that killed Osama bin Laden. Where we continue to follow the capture and killing of Osama bin Laden now. Those are just some of the scenes overnight as thousands of Americans gathered in celebration of Osama bin Laden's death. Former Navy SEAL Rob O'Neill says he has thought about the mission every day since that May Day in 20. Multiple conversations you had with Rob O'Neill over the past year and a half. How'd you get And you described that his head kind of exploded yes. when you hit I, him. I actually hit him three times because I shot him twice when he was standing and once on the ground. That is the fucking American badass. Go, go, go. We are not going for fame and we are not going for bravado. We are going for the single mom who dropped her kids off at elementary school on a Tuesday morning and then 45 minutes later she jumped to her death out of a skyscraper. If you need help, hang up and then dial your operator. I'm Rob O'Neill, and this is the Operator Podcast. Well, it is that time of the week again. Welcome back to the Operator Podcast. This is episode 89. This is a special episode, too. I'm very happy you're here because it's not going to be, uh, be me just yelling at you and then waiting for your input. I've got a very good interview today. Uh, general Tony Tata is here with me, and this is the first time I've interviewed a general officer, which is great because I can tell you what's what. I can always tell you what I think and what I know and what's right, but uh, today, General Tata is here, one of the smartest guys in the room, wherever he goes. We are going to discuss the war on terror service before 9-11, what happened after the botched... Um, Afghanistan withdrawal. We've got a lot of strong emotions there. He and I were communicating as it happened, along with a lot of other vets. I'd love to hear his point of view. And uh, I want you to hear his story of how he got into the military. Every, when I get guests on, I'd like to hear, why'd you do what you did? What drove you to that? His story is one of the most incredible I've ever heard. I don't want to ruin it for him. I want you to hear it. <laughs> it's absolutely amazing. I want to talk about his newest book, The Phalanx Code. Uh, uh, General Tata writes books that are fiction, but they're based on fact. But he's able to move a few things around, but they, they make a lot of sense. This uh, this is the third in the series of the um, Garrett Sinclair novel. Garrett's our hero. Based on um, JSOC, Special Forces, things like that. That's why I love it. And it's just a kick-ass book. He's going to tell the entire story. Here's why you want to read the book. You, um, just our thoughts on what's happening now, what might happen in the future. It's, it's, and it's, it's going to be a kick-ass interview. I'm really happy you're here. But first, I need to talk about uh, one of our sponsors. Uh, gentlemen, are you tired of your rough and rigid jeans crushing your nuts? Are you wearing jeans that you just don't feel right in or just don't seem to work? Your ass doesn't look good? Is your wife tired of looking at you in sweats or, God forbid, khakis because you hate wearing jeans? Well, today's sponsor is called The Perfect Jean, and they finally solve all of your denim difficulties. They make great-looking, perfect-fitting jeans, and they fit like sweats. No kidding. The secret? A special denim fabric, super soft, has the perfect amount of stretch so you can squat, you can do yoga, you can work out, you can lie about working out and doing yoga. You can sit around all day. You never want to take them off. I might sleep in mine tonight. They come in six sizes, the perfect jean, skinny to thick, and that is thick with two Cs at the end. They got a waist from uh, 26 to 50, lengths from 26 to 38. So big boys, short dudes, tall kings, all the rest, they got you for a limited time. Listeners of the Operator Podcast get 15% off their first order plus free shipping at theperfectgene.nyc. Theperfectgene.nyc or go get on search engine, get on Seeker and look for The Perfect Gene. When you get to theperfectgene.nyc, use code THEOPERATOR15, get 15% off. I was wearing sweats. No kidding. When mine arrived, I haven't taken them off since. Look at these things. Are you kidding me? I'm a dude that has no ass at all, but now I wear these. Again, I might sleep in them. The perfect jean, they fit perfectly right off the bat. I don't want to take them off. Seriously, comfortable enough to wear around the house. Do whatever you want. They're stretchy. There's room to move. There's comfort. There's breathing. I looked at the mirror just now. I am sold. It's finally time to stop crushing the old beanbag in uncomfortable jeans by going to theperfectgene.nyc. Our listeners, listeners to the, the Operator Podcast, 15% off your first order plus free shipping, free returns, free exchanges when you use code 
the operator 15 at checkout. That's 15% off for new customers at theperfectgene.nyc, promo code the operator 15. After you purchase, they'll ask you where you heard about them. You tell them the operator podcast, and uh, you're good to go. Go to theperfectgene.nyc, 15% off the operator 15. Also, too, if you're a listener to the operator podcast, you're familiar with some of my uh, theories that I think are true. Uh, what's going on in the world, what's actually happening, and it, and it matters from here to D.C., to China, to, to the reason that some decisions are being made. I'm, I'm convinced that there are foreign adversaries out there that are buying up land that realize if you control the food, you control the population. And you're seeing a lot of that with uh, empty shelves at grocery stores, stuff like that, not knowing uh, where what is coming from where. You've heard me talk about Moink before, and I, I love knowing where my meat comes from. We meet, we eat meat every night in this house. I know where it comes from with Moink. That uh, the place is a small family farm, small farms all across the country, actually, and you can help save the family farm and get access to the highest quality meats on earth when you join the Moink movement today. You've heard me talk about the bacon. You've heard me mention all the stuff about Moink. It's a... Uh, it's a box of meat that comes to your house, and you pick you pick what you get every month. You can cancel any time. Moink delivers grass-fed, grass-finished beef and lamb, pastured pork and chicken, sustainable wild-caught Alaskan salmon right to your door in the box I was just mentioning. Moink farmers farm like our grandparents did, and as a result, Moink meat tastes like it should because the family farm simply does it better. The Moink difference is a difference you can taste, you can feel good knowing you're helping family farms stay financially independent too. You choose the meat in that box that comes to your door, and I'm talking ribeyes, chicken, pork, uh, the, the salmon I was mentioning, uh, plus more. You can cancel any time. Um, I talk about the bacon all the time. The Moink bacon is some of the best bacon. It, it is the best bacon I've ever had in my life. Uh, Shark Tank host Kevin Allure, you've seen him a lot on the news lately too. A lot of real estate stuff. He's a brilliant businessman. He said his Moink bacon is the best bacon he's ever tasted. Uh, Ring doorbell founder Jamie Simonov jumped at the chance. He invested in Moink. I love the bacon. I love the ribeyes, the highest quality meat. Extremely easy to find. It's so easy to get to your front door. Keep American farming going by signing up at moinkbox.com slash the operator. Moinkbox.com slash the operator right now. And listeners to the operator will get free bacon for a year. I've talked about this bacon, free bacon for a year when you sign up today. Moinkbox.com slash the operator. M O I N K box.com slash the operator. Moo plus oink moink. Slash the operator, moinkbox.com slash the operator. Free bacon for a year. Go check out Moink. Join the Moink revolution. All right. Like I said, uh, the legendary General Tony Tata is here with me. We finally got to make this happen. Um, he just wrote a new book. Uh, number, I believe, is it number 16, General? Number 16, Phalanx Code. Yep. Yeah, the Phalanx Code, too. And I, I know what it's about. I You've been sending me your books, and I really appreciate it. This one... I haven't finished yet because I have a new member of the family and uh, I haven't had a kid in 15 years and I forgot how busy they can be, but I'm, <laughs> I'm getting after it. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I, I kind of want to talk at the end about that because I, I like how, uh, how the famous code is, 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 you know, it's, it's fiction, but it's really wrapped in reality and the books are fantastic yeah. and, and your reviews are great too. You, you get, you get better the reviews than a lot of military guys I know. So that's cool. Well, thanks, thanks. Uh, you know, it's about big tech and uh, crushing the neck of the little guy, and and our hero has to come in and help save the little guy. So, I love those kind of stories. So. Oh hell yeah! And and, all- and I just had my son and my eighteen month old granddaughter at my house, and so man, I feel for you. With yeah, the, it's with, it's the, with a brand new youngin. I, I mean, at least I could hand her back to my son, right? Yeah. So yeah. We're at the point we're trying to the wife and I are trying to team up on it. And it's good because, you know, even today we had a conversation where all right, we got to remember we're a team here and it's uh, and ne- neither of us had coffee yet. So we just got to keep it real for a second. And one of us right. has to make a run to the cafe or whatever. Um, yeah, but it's, it's great to have you on. Um, I, I'm actually interested in having you on because uh, I was uh, an enlisted guy in um, in the Navy. And then you're obviously an Army officer. and You went to West Point uh, 1981. Grad. Graduate. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. I don't want to get into the whole how. How did you 
get in the military, but how did West Point happen? Well, I had a brother at the Naval Academy. Uh, he was a kicker for the Navy football oh, cool. team uh, uh, back in 79, uh, the last class that was all men. And um, uh, my mother was a guidance counselor, and I was a pretty good baseball player and wrestler in high school, played on a couple of state championship teams. And, um, you know, some coaches were calling all around, and my mom – came in and said bones that was my nickname as a kid i was a skinny little kid and uh but a good athlete and she said just sign this thing i'm like well what is it she goes don't worry about it just sign it and i'm just filing some <laughs> college application it was like used car salesman and mom was a guidance counselor and um all of a sudden i started getting these calls from the west point wrestling coach and uh they recruited me to come um, uh, you know, wrestle and I, I ended up wrestling and playing baseball at West Point. I loved it. You know, it's one of those, it's great to be from, but not at kind of deals. Yes. Like it, it sucked. It's kind of, you know, like, like, you know, being a listed guy in the Navy or army or wherever, you know, there are times, you know, the suck is real, but once you've done it and you're on the other yes. side of it, it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's awesome to have, to be a, you know, a Navy SEAL and a frog man and that, and that kind of thing. And, you know, for me to be a paratrooper and serve 28 years in the military, really, um, you know, my mother always told me, you know, whatever you do, make a difference. And, mm -hmm. and so that, that's kind of been the credo that uh, I've tried to live by. So did that in the military and then um, uh, got into education was the chief operating officer at Washington, D.C. Public Schools yep. with Michelle Ree in 09, 10, 11. And then um, went down to Wake County, which is a research triangle, Raleigh, North the Carolina, 15th yeah. largest system yeah, country in the country. You know, And I spent a lot of time at Bragg as a paratrooper and 82nd Airborne. Mm -hmm. And, I, and you know, I love North Carolina. And, and so it was good to sort of come home. I'm from Virginia Beach, uh, you know, I, which I'm sure you know well. And. Uh, born and raised there. And then um, so it was close and then became Secretary of Transportation of North Carolina. Then mm -hmm. uh, Trump asked me to be the Undersecretary of Defense. Uh, so that's that's kind of my my career. And I'm in I've been in private business you know, for the last eight years or so with that one year interruption uh, helping Trump out. Yeah. So oh, so that's 45 years in a nutshell. I guess that's that's all we got today. <laughs> no, no, the, Peace the out. Way, <laughs> well i'm over here crossing off bullet points i was all impressed like, i know this i know this i know that uh all right, all right. But like, no that was a good point that you're making with um because when people ask me about seal training i went through uh buds in 1996 and i'll tell them you know it's the best time of my life but the worst time of my life because i'm done with it but i remember right, right, being, right, right. being there i'm like i don't have i have a past i don't have a future i'm just going to be in hell this is what i signed up for Right. But once you get right, done, you right, have right. the memory. But that's interesting. So so um, mom was a guidance counselor and they were recruiting you and you didn't know. <laughs> um, uh, and dad was a football coach, a high school football coach. So, I, you know, he, she was a good cop. He was a bad cop and uh, great parents, uh, fantastic parents, great role models. And and so she, you know, and so my mother passed, you know, about six, seven years ago. And when 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 she passed, my brother stands up and tells a story about, um, uh, yeah, mom, you know, put this blank sheet of paper in front of me and, and, uh, I signed it. It was my Naval Academy application. I'm like, I'm sitting there. I, I follow him uh -huh. in the, in the eulogies. And, and I'm like, wait a minute. She did the same thing to <laughs> same me. Damn thing. <laughs> Well, that's and, you know the the whole the whole blank sheet sign it is a great military recruiters use that tactic. That she did a great job. Yeah, yeah. Well, mom would have been a a one plus uh, military recruiter, and and she actually at the high school she was a counselor at the high school that we attended. So I couldn't get away with much, but um, you know what an awesome lady, and she oh, yeah. led the the region if not the state and scholarships, uh, because when you put the dollar figure on one of these West Point or Navy or Air Force scholarship, academy scholarships, you know, they, the dollar figure goes up there. And so, so my brother's at Navy, I'm at West Point, and my sister, two years younger than me, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm a sophomore at West Point, what they call a yearling. And, mm -hmm. 
And I, I come back from class and I get this yellow buck slip that says, call your sister exclamation point. And my sister ran a 442 mile in high school, was being recruited by the Olympic um, uh, team to run for the Olympics, yeah. uh, was a national champion miler in high school. And so, um, you know, I, I go down to the phone booth, dating myself here, put my quarter in, call collect back home. And and um, uh, dad answers and he says, what are you, are, his first question was, are you still there? He thought I was going to, you know, like yeah, calling from the, the call, road the that I'd run, <laughs> yeah, I, I had run away from West Point. And I said, Dad, I'm still here. Kendall, my sister wants to talk to me. Can you put her on? And um, so he, he puts her on. She runs upstairs. She's crying. She's like, Dad's trying to make me join the Air Force. I'm like, what are you talking about? You're like the best miler in the country right now with a 442 mile like you know you're That's nobody un- i'm get... still trying to wrap my yeah, mind around yeah, that. yeah yeah right right back in 1980 and and um and uh she goes somewhere in colorado he's trying to make me join the air force in colorado and i'm like yeah air force I think, academy <laughs> i think yeah, i think i know what the the print on that blank sheet of paper mom's about to give you should say. <laughs> yeah right and so i went I, I said, put dad back on the phone. And, and she's like, can you fix this for me? And I'm like, dad, look, I'm in the second class with women. Um, you know, your oldest son, my brother at Navy is in the last class with men. It's going to be okay one day. It's not okay right now. You don't want your daughter. I don't want my sister in this environment right now. She's going to get 50 scholarships. Yes. And he's like, yeah, but what if she gets hurt? I'm like, I know you You said that to me. Like I had scholarships to go play baseball at other colleges. And, you know, he's the son of Italian immigrants. Tate is an Italian last name. And, and, and so dad was always like super safe siding everything. And I'm like, look, dad, she may get hurt. Uh, but, you know, she's, you, you've gotten two kids through free. So whatever you've been saving, you can splurge on on your daughter, right? Your only <laughs> <Right>. daughter. <laughs> uh, I, I'm telling you, you don't want her to do this. And uh, so they wanted the hat trick of yes. Navy, Army, yep. Air Force, and and you know whatever college nest egg they had, and they were good savers and that kind of. But they were two teachers on teacher salaries, um, and you know obviously yeah. looking for every advantage they could get their kids in life. And so that's that's really the Tata family story with regard to the military and all of that and she ended up in west uh not west point uh, rotc she ended up at university of virginia where my father was a football and baseball standout um all conference etc in the early 50s and he was drafted by the lions and the tigers um wow. to play football and baseball went he, he, he said yeah i messed up he went to the lions he's from detroit my grandparents immigrated from italy to Detroit where he was born. And uh, he said, yeah, I got back in Detroit, started running with my old gang and showing up at football practice, a little sluggish. And he got cut before the last day uh, before the regular season started with the Lions. So, so he came back to Virginia, got his master's in education and met my mom when he was student teaching. And she was already a teacher at the Albemarle Albemarle County High School in Charlottesville. So, sixty-two years of of marriage before mom left. Dude, that's that's just incredible to to. Th- I bring up the butterfly effect a lot. That the smallest decision this decision that you might make, good or bad, twenty years ago, how did it affect you now? And just right. think about like your dad decided to go out with the boys one night. He was sluggish at practice, got cut. If he didn't go, <laughs> if, if he didn't make that decision that's to go right. out. He might have right. never met your mom, which means that we don't have you. Yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And and which a lot of people may figure, you know, would we the world would be better off. But but <laughs> um, um the the um uh just a, an amazing you know and to continue this story about my parents, who obviously I revere, um uh dad left us at 91 mom left us at, at 90 years old and and so when we got the call i was already on the way up this was it'll be three years in june um uh i'm driving up from florida 
to um, take that out to play some golf because, you know, we had had to put him in a memory care facility, leather helmet days. He probably had too many head knocks or whatever, but he was still completely mobile at 91. He would like to go out and play six to nine holes of golf. And that was our thing. You know, in the military, I'd come home, we'd go play. He wanted all the military bases, golf courses, because they were cheap, right? And, and you know, so son of Italian immigrants. And so we're on the way up, and, you know, my sister calls, and, uh, you know, they're on the family farms near Charlottesville where my mother grew up. And um, so I, I get there, we get there, and then my brother comes up. My sister's already there. Everybody kind of cycles in and sees dad. He's in hospice, you know, praying, holding his hand, telling him, how much we love them and we're exhausted emotionally, physically go home. This is June 11th and, and go to the farm and which is a mile away from where um, the memory care facility he was in. And we get the call that he left us. And my sister looks up and says, Oh my God, this is mom and dad's 66 wedding anniversary. Oh, wow. And, and, and like a chill shot up my spine, Rob, because I'm thinking, he waited like I was in Florida. My brother was in Virginia Beach. Of course, my sister was there at the farm. He waited for the kids to say goodbye, and then he went and joined mom. I mean, uh, you know, that's it's still that's, that's one yeah, of the most incredible yeah. things I've ever heard. Yeah, it, on their sixty-six wedding anniversary, and you know, and it, it was you know, mom left us uh, over Thanksgiving. She she was stubborn at ninety. She. She fell preparing Thanksgiving dinner oh, wow. for everybody at the farmhouse where everybody would come and, and the, you know, all the family members, you know, kids, all that stuff would come and celebrate Thanksgiving as a family. And, and uh, she just fell. And, and it, it was like her eighth or ninth time. And so, like, we all go down there and then the doctor said, well, she's not coming back from this one. And, um, and she didn't. But um I, I, you can tell, like, I have such admiration for the way my parents lived their life. Two school teachers. My dad was a Republican state legislator for 30 years, 15 terms in the Virginia mm -hmm. General Assembly Education Committee, got asked to run for lots of different things. He said, I'm a beer and pretzels guy. I'm focused on the community that we raised our, our family in, and I just want to help out at the local level. I don't care about anything beyond my little world right here. And I want to, I want to make it as good as it can be. Mm -hmm. And you got, you got, and mom was on the school board after she retired. And so good. that, and, and I talk about this, Rob, because the public service that I talked about at the very beginning, that's where I get it from. You know, the example that my parents set for us, um, you know, my brother spent 30 years, you know, seven years in active Navy and then 23 as a reservist, um, he was an Intel guy. Um, you, know, you know, even my sister went to ROTC and then she, she ended up getting hurt. Um, uh, you know, broke her leg, uh, which, you know, it healed up, but it took like a couple of seconds off her time. And at that elite level, oh, yeah, she was yeah. like, I can't, I, yeah, I can't do this. Anymore. I can't compete at the level. So she, she picked up field hockey and lacrosse or something and, and was a standout in, in those sports. So, um, Anyway, love love my family. Um, yeah, wow. I mean, my, that's inc yeah, that's yeah. incredible. Yeah, yeah. I bet she. I mean, you know, she's not running uh, all American levels in track, but I bet she's still hauling ass on the lacrosse field. Well, she 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 runs a race, Rob, at least once or twice a month up in the mountains. She lives at our family farm where my mother had a house built, and um. Uh, she she's such a intrinsically good person. She's a teacher, um, and she you know kind of followed in that public service. Puts us. She's a high school track coach and a high school oh, cool. uh, uh, PE teacher and health and education or uh, physical education teacher. And she calls me up on occasion and she says, uh, "Tony, I've got a 10K. I'm dedicating the last." 1.2 miles to you um anything you want me to pray about or think about you know um and um uh, i'm like and she does that very very frequently and uh so um she dedicates a mile of every one of her races to somebody in her life every race and that's the kind of um 
caring, giving person that, that she is. Yeah, that's just cool. It's um, it's it's like either a prayer or positive energy or or whatever for that person for that mile. That's yeah, that's a that's just yeah. yeah. I mean, it's cool amazing. is the only word I can describe it with. Loving but cool. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, huh. exactly. Yeah. That's a. I mean, yeah. that story right there is incredible. That um. Yeah. All right. Well, um, I wanted to get back to the uh to West Point because I had I had one I had one question I want to know about West Point because okay. uh, I, uh like I get asked all the time right around army navy game and i'm like guys i was enlisted like i don't know either place like the, like the only thing i know about the army navy game is that the, the that's the only team that off the field they'll die for each other on the battlefield type stuff like the, that's, that's, right. A, I, that's a great right. game i just was never involved with it i've been to them and they're just the, the experience is great but uh yeah is what is it like what the the first year because this this stuck with me for some reason it's probably not important maybe it didn't, doesn't happen but I heard something about you can only sit on a certain inches of your seat and then you have to eat in squares or something like for your, they call it a plebe year at Naval Academy yeah the plebe plebe year you you got to sit with your back straight you got to eat square um and take small bites as they call it and you know, if, yeah if you know and you're you're reciting plebe knowledge. Um, mm -hmm. As it's called, you, bugle notes at West Point is is the you got to memorize like how many gallons of water in Cullum Lake or you know whatever I, I've forgotten all, all of it by oh, now. Of course, but, yes, because it's not uh, important. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's completely unimportant, <laughs> but it gave the, uh, a mechanism for hazing, right? And you yeah, know, that's what I was thinking. Tata, um, how many? how many gallons of water and such and such lake? And I'm like, oh, man, you know, look, you know, I miss that chapter, you know, and then, yeah. and then you get written <laughs> up, you, know, so you get yelled well, at. See, that's yeah. the, uh, the, tor the torture with admin stuff. Cause like you can't, you're not even eating, but you got to recite. So that's just a, yeah, that's hazing, but it's very, right. it's very clever hazing. So yeah. what, do you, you know, what, uh, what position in baseball? Shortstop in second base. I was a cool. middle infielder. That's awesome. I, I'm not, I never played baseball, but I'm, we're torn because uh, Jessica's from Boston, but I'm feeling the Yankees for some reason. So it's a, it's an interesting uh, conversation. Yeah. yeah. I, I lived in Boston for a year, loved going to Wrigley and then, uh, Fenway. you know, obviously ben, or uh, Fenway. Uh, uh, what am I talking about? Chicago, uh, fen Fenway, the green monster and all of that. And, yeah. um, and uh, I took my son there. Uh, we he he played baseball in college too, and um, he was an outfielder. But uh, I we we were just talking the other day, and he said, "Dad, you know that like one of the best experiences I've had is sitting in the right field um, uh, seats at Fenway yep. and each row. They were playing the Mariners, and each row was there. And and at that time, Zach was a a, a right fielder, and so." It was just a cool one. The home run came over. We didn't get it, but it was close to us. That's just really, a really cool. cool. A great, great, you know, um, ballpark for fan oh, experience yes, because is. of the history and the and all of that. But you know, you kind of got to go with the Yanks, really. I mean, um, the the history and the legacy, and you know, the the, the Babe Ruth and Mickey oh, Mantle yeah. and Roger Maris yeah. and. Um, I, know, yeah, all, all I, I still think Fenway is the best place to see a game. Like you're saying, there's still the atmosphere yeah. and the, you know, like, like of all the, the bullshit cancel culture, the thing that, that I didn't like the most, they want to change Yaki way. And that's just, that's part of Fenway. And yeah. Right. 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 I think right. it's out of line. <laughs> yeah. It's totally out of line. I, I mean, we got to quit with this cancel culture stuff. I mean, we got to get back to this country where, you know, politics doesn't def define us or divide us. I mean, you can, I, I was talking to somebody yesterday and they're, you know, uh, families are being literally divided by these insane politics that are out there. And, and the, uh, what's happening from the progressive left and the, the undermining of this country, in my opinion, this is my opinion now, um, is really, really dis divisive and destructive to this country. And and the moderate left has kind of moved in that direction mm -hmm. because the left in general is much better at politics than yes. the right. Um, we can't hold their jockstrap uh, when it comes to politics. We don't we don't play the we're triple A ball. They're they're World Series champions mm -hmm. at, at politics and being able to 
find their path to power and holding on to power. I, it's, it's, um, and I, you know, I, I've thought about it and I, I'm, uh, you know, maybe we're just, you know, and a part of it's the media pressure, the media, you know, makes people, you know, kind of pull back from going that extra mile and the media gives the left the cover to do all these crazy things that they're doing. Like think, think about this, Rob. Um, think about Ukraine on the eve of the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. And I'll get out of the way. Putin's a bad guy. He shouldn't have invaded. It's a bad thing that happened, et cetera. So I'm not a Putin apologist. Um, mm -hmm. But think about what Biden and Blinken did. Well, they're trying to they get off you. Yeah. Think about, think about if Trump had done that, right? What would the headline have been? Trump offers to decapitate the Ukrainian yes. government mm -hmm. on the eve of the invasion, doing Putin's bidding. But because it was Biden and Blinken, it just evaporated. Nobody talks about it. But like that's how 180 percent wrong headed the Democrat, you know, Biden, Blinken, all these clowns that are running the 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 show. That's just how the, their instincts are just flat wrong and haven't served at those senior levels mm -hmm. there's nobody between you and the problem man now, like you make a recommendation to the president and you got to live with that right and so you know whether it was blinken that made the recommendation or biden told blinken to do it one of them was an idiot if not both of them I and mean, blinken's probably the most incompetent secretary of state we've ever had um in in, in this country's history that's for sure uh, there's been zero diplomacy that has had any kind of impact on anything that I know of over the last three plus years. Well, I mean, we've lost diplomacy because we've lost deterrence is how I see it. And deterrence is one of our, you know, walks yeah. off the carry, carry a big stick or armor tank division. And we've just lost right. that. And that, that right there, you lose credibility, I think. And then, uh, yeah, what, 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 mm -hmm. the Ukraine, the Ukraine thing, um, there is no diplomacy there, but my, my issue with Ukraine is it was never a NATO nation anyway. And here's I know you know more about Ukraine than I do. I I I, I was there in uh, 1998 and I got to work for a corrupt government. And I always say it's it's fun to work with a corrupt government if you're if you don't care about uh, anything. But you, you right. get it, like we, we we showed up uh, in in winter in Odessa, and the first thing they did was they gave us a, an entire resort to ourselves, one platoon, and we're the we were the only. Um, only people there except for like the 40 women that they'd sent over which is kind of a different story <laughs> <laughs> a younger sure. younger that, man that, that, that'd be a whole different podcast right <laughs> yeah exactly. right all right, all right. <laughs> but um but now they're spinning it into this uh like i saw a commercial recently and it's ronald reagan talking about defending the soviet union and uh you know gorbachev telling this wall he's talking about uniting with your friends and be willing to die for this but it's a it's a commercial for ukraine and they're pumping it. I saw it on Fox News, and some some right. super PAC paid for it. Obviously, a lefty, because I don't think anyone. Well, I don't think a lot of people understand that Ukraine's not NATO, and it's really not our problem. Right, right. Well, I I think what you know. Let's go back to 2014. Remember, you know, during 2012 when Obama was sitting down with the Russian foreign minister. And he famously got caught yeah. on a hot mic and said, mm -hmm. I'll have more flexibility after the election. So a year later, Russia invades Crimea. And, yes. um, you know, there was no gnashing of teeth. There was no hue and cry. There was no like, oh, Obama's a Putin stooge. There, you know, there was diplomacy that took place. Didn't involve America. It involved Russia, um, Ukraine. Uh, France and Germany in what was called the Paris uh, or the Normandy format. And they they said, yeah, all right, just stop where you are and it's OK. Crimea yes. is now in Russia. And so it was OK under Obama to cede territory from Ukraine. And that, you know, historically has kind of ebbed back and forth. Um, but now, you know, because it's useful to tie Trump to Putin, uh, and there are enough people that believe that lie, they got to keep that false narrative going, and it undermines the national security of our country. These yes. people, Rob, the, the, the progressive left, 
absolutely do not care about the national security of the United States. They, they just do not care. And in fact, uh, when you see these people supporting Hamas, uh, I mean, I wonder how we would react today if an airplane hit the World Trade Center, an airplane hit the Pentagon, an airplane hit the Capitol building. How how would it be 51 to 49 percent? I don't know. I mean, it, it's a really good question because we have lost that cohesion and where there used to be sort of overlapping bell curves, it's now a dumbbell. You're left or you're right and you're 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 in your trench line. And if you pop out, um, mm -hmm. you get sniped by the media and and, uh, the, you know, the media comes after you hard so that you stay in your trench line, you stay in your foxhole um, and you don't you know, it's like a World War One trench warfare. And, and if you dare to come across that beaten zone, mm -hmm. you're going to you're going to you may get across to be able to throw a hand grenade in there, but you're going to pay a heavy price. Well, no, no, being in a uh, in the education system to the D.C. area, because I know, I mean, famously, uh, defectors from Russia from the KGB said they're going to infiltrate a couple things. One of them was our education. And you can see that happen. I mean, were you seeing that yeah. there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, the teachers union working with Michelle Ree, who was uh, is a great woman and a very, very good leader. You know, we we had to fight the. uh AFT, American Federation of Teachers, you know, the teachers union, we had to fight the Teamsters uh, because for them, it was all about the adults, right? And zero focus on the children. They, you know, kind of like they couldn't care less about national security. They, they couldn't care less about st student achievement for the children. And so that has infected uh, the, from my point of view, uh, many, many, many school systems, uh, I would say the majority of school systems across the country with this sort of uh, woke mind virus, as as it's being called. Um, and, and this was, you know, 10, 12 years ago, I was in education. What, you know, I, I brought in uh, creative, innovative, solutions-oriented leadership, and we created smaller schools, uh, young men's academy, young women's academy, leadership schools, uh, STEM academies. Uh, today, I mean, the mayor of Raleigh texted me last year and said, Tony, your leadership academies are the highest performing uh, schools in the state. And, and you know, so but the, the left fought me tooth and nail every step of the way as we created out of whole cloth these new academies. We created a career technical school. And and if you come at the left with these concrete solutions, they'll fight you. But then they'll take credit for it if it's successful. They they are they eradicated my name from e every one of them. And I, I don't care as long you know I can still walk down the streets of Raleigh in East Raleigh, Southeast Raleigh, and parents will stop me and say, "Mr. Tata, thank you so much for establishing the Young Men's uh, Leadership Academy or the Young Women. If my you changed my son's life, and I'm good for a week, a month if somebody tells me that. And you know, getting back to the discussion about my mother and and saying always try to make a difference. You know, if you can have that kind of impact, um, yes, as, as you had for the world uh, with the the things that you've done. Uh, so uh, I, I mean, I we're in a real tough spot with with this uh, woke mind virus uh, and and the progressive left and they, cause they got a lot of momentum. The media uh, loves them. Um, uh, the, you know, and it's all about power. It's got nothing to do, yes. do with um, um, anything material for the country. And what shocks me is that, you know, people that I think are reasonable people buy into, into this. And I, I'm like, how, how can you how can you say it's OK for some judge based right. on some bogus charges where, you know, I'm talking about Trump in the Ingeron case, um, you know, and James and, and like there was no victim. There was no fraud. There was no penalty. There was there was nothing. You know, all, everybody that he supposedly like inflated values, um, they they actually came and just testified on his behalf said yeah i'd love to continue to do business with them and i'm like all you got to do is look at zillow on occasion and you know your home value can change by five hundred thousand. you know for yes. just a small you know 
uh, you know, depending on which way the wind is blowing. And uh, so, I, you know, hopefully the great majority of Americans understand what's happening and 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 turn out to vote and try to reverse this tide because if we don't if we don't do that rob this year that that this uh, is it. I, I think so this is this is this is it uh they'll break through like a dam break in and that water will rush downhill people will start getting arrested um trump will be in jail yep. um his they'll put his family in jail they mm-hmm. they will they will take a victory in november as a green light to do it's whatever over. the hell they want to do it, it's it's over yeah and what you and i fought for was yeah, not that's this. that's the that's the thing too that's that's why i get so uh, um you know amped up about it and i've heard i've heard you talk before and i've been saying this too because I, I brought up the like the pillars that like uh yuri bezmanov was a kgb guy that defected here and he said we're going to infiltrate the education entertainment and, the, and and um the media and the you know the freedom of press it was because we don't trust the government and your job is to report on that and hold them accountable. Right. But now they're mm-hmm. doing what the communists wanted them to do, which is you speak up, we're going to crush you. Right. Right. And, and you parrot the narrative of, of the administration. If it's the administration you like, right. If it's the administration that gives you power. And, and so uh, what, what's happening is instead of holding a microphone up to the government and asking tough questions and holding them accountable. They've turned their back on the American, uh, uh, on people and are holding a, a megaphone and they're shouting at the American people, whatever the administration told them to. Phalanx code honestly came out of uh, this concept. Remember about three years ago, it was a four must bought Twitter and uh, the some dude eating a cheeseburger in the White House called some dude eating a cheeseburger on Twitter and said, hey, man, I don't like these 40 accounts. Deep platform them. And the other guy said, yeah, sure, no problem. And I'm like, Jesus, that's about as un-American as it gets. Big mm-hmm. tech and big government colluding to put their jackboot on the neck of the little guy and under the guise of, like, misinformation. What, you know, come on. That's bullshit. That's bullshit. You, That's you know, bullshit. Yeah, yeah. We we all know that you know if you can call misinformation um, uh, in anything that you don't like or doesn't fit your narrative, mm-hmm. and and that becomes uh, the Soviet style, yes. the communist, the Marxist, and and so out of that came the idea for the Phalanx Code. Phalanx Corporation um, is. Is the worst carniv- carnivore instincts of Facebook and Google, right? All you got to do is look at Google Gemini today, and like, you know, it's all woke yeah. mind virus stuff, right? You can't get a you can't get a white guy. Yeah, in George history, Washington right? was there, <laughs> Yeah, right. There are no white guys in history, um, oh. and and um, so and and uh, you know, and I wrote this before Musk bought Twitter, but I envisioned. You know, someone like Musk doing um, developing decentralized Wi-Fi, decentralized finance and protecting individual freedoms and liberties. And so it was mega corporation tech company and big government going after individual liberties and freedoms in the form of decentralized Wi-Fi and 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 finance and so yeah. forth. And and our hero, Garrett Sinclair, has to um uh try to save this project optimus which is the um elon musk type company and you know it starts out with the the sinclair the hero in prison from something that happened in total empire the book that precedes this and uh, and you don't have to read them in order you can read them in any order but uh i i provide enough backstory but you know, as I was writing it, metaphorically, I, I was trying to describe, like, we're all imprisoned by this uh, administrative media technology narrative. Like, Google won't let you out of that prison. They won't, they won't yeah. find you a path to the truth. They'll tell you what they want you 
to to believe it's true. And so we're all sort of imprisoned. And and so in the first chapter, I'm not giving anything away. Um, Sinclair breaks out, and um, uh, and and to me now he's running across that metaphorical beaten zone in the World War One trench line I talked about, and they're constantly trying to come after him because he's seeking the truth. And just like we talked about a minute ago, Rob, a, a lot of like you, when you and I signed up, raised our right hands and, uh, you know, th- the way the country is headed right now, that's not, it's not certainly not what I thought I was fighting for oh, no. to see this, this kind of corruption. And I mean, there's so much uh, evil and corruption at the highest levels of our government now what um uh that uh, sinclair has these epiphanies that like really all that matters is your family and your teammates your shipmates as you would say mm-hmm. and and um at the end of the day you just got to protect them and then that's what that's where the story gets interesting mm-hmm. uh with regard to phalanx code so um, yeah, we're we're in a real bind in this country with the media and the corrupt government and the corrupt technology companies, uh, because they have so much money, they have so much power that they can they can literally control your life. It's almost it, um, you, we needed someone like Elon Musk with the assets to buy Twitter because you couldn't. It was almost like you couldn't rise up. Remember, Parler was just yeah yeah Russian. Yeah. They had a meeting up deep. there with boom. They're still not around. <laughs> Yeah, they got deplatformed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dan Bongino, I think, was involved in that. Yeah. They were an alternative to Twitter. Twitter, Twitter called the government up and said, "Hey, take this competition away from me." Yep, and they did. And, and uh, yeah, yeah, okay, sure. <laughs> and even you know, uh, uh, got... Elon Musk was a darling of the left because the Tesla, the electric cars, and all of a sudden he's hated by the left. Yeah, because he's protecting free speech, and they don't want free. They speech. don't like free speech. Uh, now, what 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 is it about that? Because I've been to a lot of uh, different studios, left and right. And, um, you know, the producers are smart people. The on-air talent are definitely smart people. You got to be smart to be running all that stuff. There are people that got to know they're full of shit. What is, what are, <laughs> is it just the power they're getting of staying on TV or what are they getting out of this knowing they're blatant? I, I, I think it's the power. And I think there might be like a kernel of belief in there that, okay, it's better to do X, Y, and Z than A, B, and C. If X, Y, and Z is a little bit left and A, B, C is a little bit right. And it just gets pulled apart because there can be no compromise. And and uh, if you compromise, then then you take away that power. You take away um, the dividing the country is how the left stays in in, in power. Uh, it, you notice, like Biden lied when he was running for president, uh, you know, three and a half years ago, and said he he was going to unify the country. Yeah, he's not he's not even made an effort to unify the country he he ha, he is prosecuting his political enemies and you know the the january 6 people are in jail i mean he he could he could take a magnanimous step to unify the country if he wanted a unified country but he's deliberately not doing that because the path to power is divide us more with the lgbtq stuff divide us more with the MAGA versus, you know, everything else stuff, divide, divide, divide. And the more you can divide, uh, the better for the left, uh, because um, that that creates fear and anxiety and it will drive a higher vote turnout as opposed to a unifying vision. I mean, if you start to listen to some of these speeches, you know, Trump is painting a unifying vision for the country. Yeah, you know, he he could have gone after Hillary Clinton when when he was president, president yeah. but he chose not to. He he threw her a bone, and and you know that that's what I say. We play triple A ball; they play yeah World Series championship ball because you know that's not in their playbook. There's no there's no bone to be thrown uh, unless no. it's a ninja star at you know at our forehead. Well, they're they're so good at it. Like you know, you say that they're they're lockstep the Democrats, and Democrats know if they go against the party, they're going to get primaried and they're not going to get any money. And right. you know that again, that comes that comes back to your personal stuff. Are you willing to put your neck out there? And a lot of them aren't. We got guys like John Tester, who's a senator from my home state of Montana, and he'll go back up to his campaigning right now and how he's blue collar 
John Tester, as soon as he gets back, it's whatever Schuster wants. Yes, sir. No, sir. Can I have another yep. one, sir? Yep, exactly. And I think and, that's and why I mean, Manchin probably. This, again, too, is why we need the Electoral College, because the echo chambers in D.C. and uh, New York, those are the people just talking to each other. And then we get to hear it all because, you know, it's I mean, we got we got people watching The View five days a week and they think it's news. And, right, 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 right. And it's, and it's again, it's, it's it's hard to get. You need to re- do some serious research because even if it says it was fact checked, you got to find out who's the fact checker. Which which purple yeah, right, hair, right, right. purple hair, yeah, non-binary. Check. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Doesn't the like fact checkers are just like reinforcing fires for the for the bullshit that's already out there. I mean, the fact checkers are are you know the only thing that comes remotely close to. Um, level on the inf- disinformation from the left is community notes on on x twitter you know whatever mm-hmm. we're calling it today so mm-hmm. um I, I think musk is doing a good job of trying to nudge that to where you know it's it's factual and you can actually vote if you think it's factual and and if you don't then why was it not properly cited you know all of that you know you you've got these bozos that are for cnn and other places they're not they're op they're influence operators they're operatives Operative. this is a um a, yeah a major information war that we're in right now and cnn msnbc abc cbs nbc etc they're all um participants in the influence operation to try to get the american people to believe certain things to think certain ways and and to achieve a certain end state that they desire they're not remotely interested in reporting the truth no at, and at all they're so good at it too and it's the whole thing where if we make and they've admitted this on camera that if we say a lie a, enough people will believe it and i've heard so many times uh from left-wing people on tv where they say well you know if you believe the right-wing media blah 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 it's like on what fucking planet do we have a right-wing media <laughs> and but right, you know, right. i have liberal friends that I've talked to and uh, and see, I, th- I even think liberals are victims because they've been just bombarded by the leftists because they just take and right. take. But I, I've talked to people in my, my hometown of Butte, Montana, and I said, you're a Democrat, huh? And they're like, yeah. And I said, well, you're obviously pro-choice. No, no, I'm pro-life. Oh, well, then you're obviously an atheist. No, I'm Catholic. You're not a fucking Democrat. I, you want me to keep going down the list of shit? Yeah, right, right, right. But right, they just right. feed you this bull. And then the other problem, I think, too, and I don't want to go off on a rant. Um, the, the Democrats are great politicians. The Republicans are a bunch of pussies. Right. Yeah. That's just, that's I, just my you know, Yeah. Well, no, it's kind of what we've been saying with regard to triple A ball versus world yeah, series. That's a better ball. way. That's a, and, that's a bit, that's a more. Yeah. Way <laughs> so. uh, but, but, you know, I, I, I think that, um, you know, one of the things Trump has challenged is kind of this uniparty concept uh, where, you know, I, I genuinely believe that president Trump has the interests of the country, the values, the, the the people in mind when uh, uh but but if you say that right you know you'll get hate mail that tata said that right because okay. you know you're like what are you kidding me he's been 97 counts of whatever and i'm like yeah i mean it's all make-believe right yeah, except yeah, you, for it's having a, a very real impact on him and his life and uh, i mean you know, he could have gone quietly into the night if he didn't and, run for yep, president. He would be fine. They would, he he would be fine, right? And um, you know, is everything he's done perfect? No, but no. you know, who who is like? Um, oh. I, 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 but he, by and large, has uh, set a, a standard for uh, America first, um, yes. which which absolutely must be. Uh, the path forward for for us because right now uh, half of America doesn't count in the Biden administration. Even very yeah. clearly, no, they don't. Not all, at all. All, mm-hmm. all he cares about are the people that are going to vote for him, and he, he and and really all he cares about is staying in power. Yes, so he can aggrandize himself, his son, and his brother. Because that's all he's done is create this corruption machine. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it appears anyway. Um, uh, and I mean, if you had the evidence of the Hunter Biden laptop, let's say it was the Don Jr. laptop. Oh, Jesus. Um, and, and, and um, you know, the checks 
that, you know, uh, from one brother to the president, uh, uh, you know, the, the different bank accounts, you, you would you would have like impeachments, you would have criminal trials uh, that that were actually meaningful because that you would yeah. not have make believe trials. Um, you would have actual meaningful trials with evidence. Right. Instead of some, you know, woman who uh, evidently can't remember what year oh uh, she met Donald Trump. Right. You know, so uh, anyway. But they, they force feed the, the operatives in the media, obviously the right wing media. Uh, they feed people that so much and they believe it. If, like I know I know Don Jr. pretty well. And um, he's just clean as an arrow. If, if they weren't all clean, they would have been busted for something because yeah. they're hunting. Yep. But like they, they'll show a pic like Don Jr. is a big outdoorsman. So like they'll show a picture of him like bringing a shark out of the ocean. He's sweating. They'll say, oh, he's sweating. He's obviously on cocaine when there's video right. of Hunter Biden obviously on cocaine. <laughs> Right, Nothing. Right. And that's Russian disinformation. I, I, I mean, look at the Trump kids, Don Jr., you know, Eric. Um, yeah, you know, yeah, you you pick one, Tiffany, uh, Barron. They're mm-hmm. like all upstanding citizens that yeah. are, you know, have have good families, good values, uh, and and um I you know, I, Melania is beautiful, yeah. the most beautiful first lady we've ever had. Ever, Speaks never on the six cover or of seven life. languages, never on the cover of anything. And yeah. and so, and um, they make fun of her accent. It's like, she, how many languages do you speak? <laughs> right, 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 exactly. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, it, it's it's really um, insulting to half the country uh, that uh, what's what is- transpired here. It is. You, you know, one of my uh, one of my go to's to piss off leftists is, uh, look, I know you're gonna st- you want your first president. You're going to get it in four years and Ivanka's going to be just fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> right, right, that, right, that'll right, get, right. That'll get some uh, some head spinning. Uh, but um, yeah, yeah, but like, uh, I, you know, I, I like to because I think, you know, when you whenever you ask someone why they don't want Trump, they're like, well, he's going to he's going to end democracy or he, they bring up the Constitution, not knowing anything uh, about and like okay how and they can't explain it but like right now i was i used to make fun of uh when you know people say i plead the fifth obviously you plead the fifth i would jokingly say i plead the third and like what's the third i'm like well i don't need to quarter people in my house without my you know in a peacetime and i would joke about the third amendment but now in new york they might need to invoke that because they're the, the squatter laws and we're technically being right. invaded. And if you're there 30 days, that's their house, not your house. And a woman just got arrested yeah. for putting locks on a house she was trying to sell her dead mom gave her. And that's normal. Right, to right, right, right. Yeah. I, I mean, the Babylon Bee, which, you know, yes. can be hilarious. They they had uh, uh, something yesterday or today that said um, homeowner arrested for failing to give Wi-Fi password to squatter. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like. How funny is that? But it's they true, have, right? They have some, no, but it, but again, this we're in a state where you know five years ago, some of the shit that's going on, we would have said, yeah, that's hilarious. But even back, I remember when, uh, the, like, when I was getting out of the Navy, the big thing was don't ask, don't tell, which is fine. Um, you know, they wanted to legalize gay marriage, even though, like even Barack Obama said marriage between a man and a woman. And one of the arguments was, uh, well, you know, if, if they do this, eventually they'll want to marry themselves. They want to marry their houses. I'm like, well, that's ridiculous. And now we're there. Right. And, right. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's almost like the it's almost like the the founding fathers knew what they were doing when they wrote all these documents. Yeah. How smart were those guys? Right. Uh, like, uh, you know, they. They say maintain a navy, but raise an army, and that, those words mean something. Those they wanted words. a permanent navy that could project combat power and project power to protect commerce lanes and shipping lanes. They wanted to scale an army up and down, raise it if necessary, uh, because they were watching all the big land wars in Europe, and they were yes. afraid of a big federal government. And I, I mean, just simple things like that, and then. First Amendment is first because it's the most important, yes, right? Freedom of speech and religion. Um, you know, that I, I mean it's um I just I I keep and you got you got these geniuses saying, well, Trump's gonna, you know, end democracy. Like what so what you're trying to do is pack the Supreme Court, yep. um, remove a guy from a ballot, um yep. and uh, you know, bankrupt him. Uh, uh, persecute political enemies 
all in the name of protecting, protecting uh, democracy. De- de- democracy. You're, you need to destroy it. It's like uh, the Vietnam thing. We need to destroy the village to save it. That's exactly what the mindset is of the of the uh, progressive left. That's and that it's got to be. I, th- I it, this can't be on accident. A lot of this nonsense going around. Um, it, yeah, it's it's something with the chaos to be here because I, I mean, they've got to be- really believe this country is evil and we need to. What's the thing they always say? We're reimagining stuff like it, that's never worked. <laughs> All right, like, right, right. like AOC is a big reimaginer. She was explaining how Rico is not a crime yet. They're uh, trying to put Trump in jail for Rico violations. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. But yeah, you mentioned sure. the army, too. We got to Let's if you don't mind, I want to jump into a little bit of that. Sure. Um, sure. Because uh, I've had this um, I've had this issue personally and with friends um, of veterans of the Afghan war. And watching the debacle in uh, 2021 mm-hmm. um, of we all know what happened that that the like the way I put it was if we took the bin Laden team, which I thought were some of the best tactical minds on the ground ever assembled mm-hmm. and asked that team to come up with the worst plan possible to leave Afghanistan, we would have done exactly what they did. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't based on any tactics. It wasn't based on anything other than pol- politics. How can we? How can we say we pulled out of Afghanistan? And my, what, what I'm finding is uh, I'm getting asked, was that was that worth it, Afghanistan? Right. Yeah. So I, I had troops that served with me in Afghanistan calling me, texting me. Hey, sir, you know, they were upset. They were they were crushed um, and and asking me, was it worth it? And, you know, I had served as the undersecretary of defense for policy number three guy in the Pentagon up until January of that year. And and um, we left in place um, good plans to collapse everything on Bagram. And, yeah. you know, Bagram's the most protected yes. um, uh, airfield, um, uh, the Northern Alliance up there. What, you know, it's, it's a very friendly tribal area. Not to say that there weren't issues in that province, but, you know, by and large, that it was, was the place to be. The JFK. <laughs> yeah, right, right, exactly. And and um, so the other thing that we had said, Rob, was, um, uh, you know, because we we made a recommendation to the president in December, um, uh, before we left to keep twenty five hundred troops there, two thousand or twenty five hundred, um, and and to uh, to be able to collapse onto Bagram. And we were even entertaining a, a concept to allow for the 82nd to come in and own um, Kandahar, um, yes. Host, and Bagram, allow people, you know, kind of like a detachment left in contact, allow our NATO partners to fold up, come into those protected areas, and then yes, everybody move, yes. move, move up to, to Bagram. So... You know, all of those conversations, all of that was happening. All of those things were in writing. And 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 when the DOD team came in, um, the current secretary of the Army was the transition team leader. Uh, I had she canceled four meetings to to meet with me, the number three guy in the Pentagon, because she thought I had no value to add. Right. It was very dismissive, very arrogant. Um, very uh, a, 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 a real disservice to the country. Just uh, the hubris from the whole team was unbelievable. I served with Lloyd Austin. I was his deputy commanding general when he was commanding general of the 10th Mountain Division. I was an airborne battalion commander for him when he was an airborne brigade commander. He was my first line supervisor twice. And mm-hmm. I served with him two other times and in, in other in the 82nd. And, and uh, you know, so I. I know him as well as anybody know him. I left him a note with my phone number. Lloyd, look, this is big stuff, man. You know, a lot going on. Give me a call. So what does he do? He purges the all the defense um, boards that maintain continuity. Like, you know, Trump had put me on the defense policy board. To, and that, that was, you know, 100 years of tradition or however long it's been in existence. The outgoing policy guy goes on the board maintains their security clearance and can advise and assist as necessary. And, you know, and, and it's a prestigious board. And he, you know, a week later he purges everybody. 
And, and so they wanted no assistance. They, they thought that we had nothing to add. And I'll tell you what, um, I was on Brian Kilmeade's radio show when he was mm-hmm. testifying recently about his absence. Um, I was, I was going to ask he, about he, that, but yeah, can, can yeah, you yeah, yeah, yeah. for the audience yeah. explain well, uh, what happened? I'll, I'll tell you. Yeah, well, I'll tell you. He got up in front of of Congress under oath and said there were no systems in place to account for, you know, for him to for proper notification. I'm like, in what universe are you living, wild man? The the um, when I went from like January 2nd to January 15th or whatever it was. I went to five, six different countries with the team, and I signed several defense deals with uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, Mozambique, Morocco, et cetera. And um, the, I had to sign a letter that was co-signed by my office manager, uh, who was a GS you know, 13 or 14, been there 30 years, appointing my deputy as the acting under and 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 she made sure that i did all that the you know the 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 front office staff within the secretary uh you know office of secretary of defense is very very competent and capable and they're good people and they just want the trains to run on time and they know all the rules and regulations. Very important. I, I would never accuse Lloyd Austin of lying to Congress, but there were systems in place to, uh, I mean, and, and it, you don't even need a system to know that you need to tell the president that you're not going to make it to work and you're going to be out for a few days. And yeah. so yeah. Uh, it, uh, it, it's, and, you know, I, I pray for him. I hope his cancer gets better and as it seems to, to, to do, but it's inexcusable. And again, the, the way the media treated that, you know, no biggie, no. you know, you know, you're a racist if you, if you no. criticize them. Um, and, and, and so, so, but anyway, getting back to Afghanistan, they purged everybody. They, they thought we had no value add. We had a good plan. We mm-hmm. left, 2,500 troops there, 2,000 troops to, to help manage. And what we had said to NATO, because uh, I, I, I had calls with my NATO partners all the time. We had great relationships, this idea that, oh, Trump broke NATO. Trump made NATO stronger. And um, the, the calls um, would be, we came in together, we yes. adjusted troop levels together, and we're leaving together. So we'll let you know when we're leaving. Well, they didn't do that, right? They didn't, tell they didn't. They didn't. They didn't need all that backstory about how we had been having these conversations with NATO. They just left, leaving thirty other countries or twenty nine other countries out yeah. there. You know, and, and as you know, Rob, you've been there. Um, if you're a provincial reconstruction team from Denmark out in, uh, you know, along the Iranian border, yeah, you got a long way to go, man, and you got bad dudes all around you, Iranians. West of you, Taliban, east of you, um, you got to get to Helmand, uh, through Helmand to get to Kandahar. It's it's tough going. And and so the story, the most unreported story other than offering Zelensky a ride out is how Biden broke NATO. Biden fundamentally broke NATO. NATO, and I have friends over there in, in pretty senior positions, he fundamentally broke NATO They were, you know, these different countries were just livid that the administration just said, peace out, we're leaving. And then, you know, you got people falling off airplanes, you got chaos, you got, you know, uh, suicide bombers, you got drones Mm -hmm. striking the water boy um, and, and, you know, absolute amateur hour. You got Frank McKenzie laughing about it on TV. Um, uh, the CENTCOM commander. I, I mean, it was it was an absolute amateur hour. And the, you know, the infuriating part about this is that, you know, we we had a plan and we knew what we were doing. I'm a combat veteran. I served served over there. I I I knew what the right thing to do was. And I'm not 
talking about the joint staff or Mark Milley or any of them, you know, in my opinion, either everybody counts or nobody counts. They've all served and, and fought for their country and all of that. Um, you know, they and they get sucked into the politics of this. Yes, this was do. on the civilian leadership and the civilian leadership failed this country in, in a in the most astounding way possible in the withdrawal from Afghanistan, fracturing NATO and psychologically wounding a generation of veterans, mm -hmm. 20 years of veterans that had cycled through there. And if you can't tell that I'm pissed off about it, I'm pissed off about it. So. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, well, that's an underreported story, too. People don't know that we left 29 countries back there because right. they know they know uh, we left the gear back there. They know they heard about Abbey Gate because they were forced to. But I mean, even that at Abbey Gate, you can tell the breakdown in the chain of command because of the breakdown of the upper echelon of the chain. When the when a sniper saw a suicide bomber eyes on request permission to fire and his senior uh, probably officer said he couldn't fire. Right. I, and he, he said, why? And he's like, I don't, I don't know. Like there's, there's a breakdown there somewhere. I mean, there's delegation in there, but I'm assuming I wasn't there, but uh, because of the chaos that was going on, no, nobody knows who's leading what. And all of a sudden, it, it, you know, you got poor Afghans hanging on, not even realizing hanging on to a C-17 is not a good idea because it goes pretty fast. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Well, I mean, the Obama 8,000 mile screwdriver came back into play. Remember, that's why we didn't defeat ISIS. Trump comes in, gets rid of the 8,000 mile screwdriver, lets commanders make decisions on the battlefield in real time. And all of a sudden, ISIS is defeated, destroyed. Yeah. And, right. and, and so you get these clowns back in and all of a sudden, you know, they're micromanaging everything from the White House. And, and it just doesn't work and it's never worked and it never will work. So from LBJ, you know, calling bombing runs in Vietnam to Obama trying to man micromanage ISIS to Biden and Austin trying to micromanage, yeah. you know, the disaster in Afghanistan. They, they just made it worse. ISIS was the uh, JV team, I guess, was the, with the yeah. president. Yeah. And then he, oh uh, God. he remember when he laughed off Russia? Too? He was like, what is this, the 80s? It's like, Russia's right, still right, right. Real, man. That's just, that's yeah. crazy. Yeah, well, yeah, but you can't you can't resurrect that, Rob. I, I mean, yeah, think about it. He he minimized Russia and he ceded Crimea to yeah. to Russia, and yet he's still the lion of the Democrats, right? I'm like, yeah. so you know, he if anybody's a Putin stooge, it's Obama. Well, he's he's no Susan Rice, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but but you know what else too? Just I mean, because. You get high enough, I think, in politics. You're working at on a one a one party scale. What you know, Trump is obviously an outsider. What people don't realize also, the past four administrations, there's only one that Putin didn't invade someone else, and that was Donald Trump's because he went into Georgia right. when Bush was there, and he went invaded Ukraine twice. Yep. Um, and, yep. But th that is just proof right there with the strong United States. Um, there's a strong world. And that's but but now with the media, if you say, "Well, I'm a, I'm pro America," all of a sudden you're a domestic terrorist, right? Exactly. Yeah. Or if you're a PTA mom, um, oh God you forbid, know, yeah. uh, standing up at the microphone, um, standing up for your children and mm -hmm. and what they're being taught and what what por porno is being allowed in the libraries, mm -hmm. um, you know the uh, you know all all of this like you know banning books and all that you know it's all such a lie and 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 people buy into it and they and 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 it's really uh, my my only hope and prayer for for the country that we have served is that people are starting to see through uh the the uh smoke that the the mainstream media creates and thank god for elon musk you know 42 billion wasn't the price of twitter it's the price of free speech and <laughs> no and the kidding. ability so so um uh, and you know when you have a hundred billion or whatever you got, it's it's sort of meaningless, right? And and totally meaningful, right? Here's forty two billion. I want to own this platform so people can understand. Mm -hmm. um, and and to see a guy like Musk, who's a really obviously really smart guy, the the um, uh, you know what he does with that platform, his his narrative arc as a you know, let's say as a character in a story, he's gone from fairly like neutral to to seeing the the obvious, like the Google Gemini garbage and the mm -hmm. 
and the and the 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 border stuff and and you know on and on and on all the lies of the left and and the media um and and he's now you know coming across pretty hard saying woke mind virus you know and and uh, you know so i i wouldn't say he's red pilled but he's 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 seeing the the truth and what i what i'm hoping for praying for is that there are millions of americans that are seeing this lawfare the the lying uh from the media the lying from the administration the lack of care this i mean this is the most um uh uncompassionate um this administration lacks compassion beyond any administration i've ever seen they simply don't care about the american people as a whole what they care about is staying in power aggrandizing themselves and and uh you know making sure their political opponents are are arrested and and i mean what country are we living in no, that's the definition of fascism, and that's and right. and it's the uh, it, what what it seems like what the right gets accused of doing is by the left is exactly what the left is doing, because communism one hundred and one is is jail your opponents and like Zelensky is doing it in Ukraine, yet we're defending yeah. democracy by pumping all the money in there because that place is so damn corrupt. Right. I mentioned I was there before. If you would ask me five years ago, what's the most corrupt state uh, of country in Europe? It's um, Ukraine. So there's there's something beyond fighting for democracy. I think there's still some money running through. There's some contracts running through there that a lot of people in D.C. don't want us to know about. Maybe. Uh, well, I mean, even what you worked at the Pentagon. What what's uh? So they what did they start doing the audits around 2017 and failed all of them since? Yeah, I mean they can't account for you know billions, if not trillions, of dollars yeah. that going back in time. And um, you know, I was there for nine months and. Um, the, you know, it's, it's a big giant bureaucracy with a $800 billion budget. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, every year, um, you know, chasing all that down there, there, there aren't enough accountants in the world, I think. Yeah, that's probably hold true. people accountable, um, accountable for, um, a lot of the largesse out there. So, um, you know, and, and, you know, honestly, it's, uh, uh, yeah, we're we're out of bullets. Uh, the world's out of bullets, uh, and you know you can look at Ukraine as you know if Russia is really um, you know our national defense strategy. Let's China, Russia, Iran, North Korea is four four main adversaries in that order. Um, you follow the money; it's all going to the Middle East and um, and Ukraine uh, and. Uh, in Indo Pacific Command, um, with our number one threat, China, yes. is is having to, you know, uh, get by to get by. Like they're having to on a shoestring, uh, comparatively to the to the Middle East and and uh, Ukraine. Uh, you know, NATO, um, and you know, NATO is an important relationship, and and uh, because you know it was. It was rebuilt after World War II, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Western Europe was, uh, as was Japan, and they became major trading partners. And the whole Marshall Plan was about uh, rebuilding these nations that were devastated and to include our enemies and and making them, uh, remaking them in our image so that they would have um, capital markets with which we could trade and and uh, mm -hmm. it would promote freedom and it would be a, a bulwark against communism. And, and so in that regard, I understand the high concept of protecting NATO uh, and making sure NATO remains front and center as a, as a hedge against uh, Russian hegemony in the region and expansionism. Uh, what I don't understand uh, well, I, I do understand it. Uh, remember, I said that uh, this administration fundamentally broke NATO in the wake yeah. of Afghanistan. Um, well, that was August, September, right? Um, three years ago. And then what happened late September, early October? You know, 
Putin's tanks are going into Belarus and the border of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So the, the green light was on. And what didn't happen? You have to ask yourself from the U.S. State Department. There were zero negotiations to try to stop right. what was happening. There was no conversation. And why is that? Well, think about it. NATO was fundamentally broken. What better unifies an entity better than anything else? And that's a common threat. Mm -hmm. And so the Biden administration's play with, uh, you know, and even Biden said, well, maybe a minor incursion's fine, right? He said that. I'm not making that up. He said that, you know, if it's a minor incursion, then that's a different story. Um, so, um, he, it's like he invited that, right? Because it now creates this like, oh, NATO's never been stronger. And so NATO had to have, you know, kind of bite their tongue, stiff upper lip, whatever you want to call it. And, and um, you know, uh, eat crow, uh, you know, while they're, they're fuming mad, they're like, okay, well, we got Russia now knocking on the door. So let's focus on that instead of bitching about the, the United States. That's that's, you know, other than whatever corrupt dealings Hunter Biden may have in Ukraine, I would say that that's probably number one or number two in the, the rationale as to why we're why we're uh, this administration is so focused on that. I think it's important to send the message to uh, Putin um, that that, you know, what he's doing is is, is wrong. I also think that. Uh, if you recall, during the Balkan days, and I actually had a SEAL team working for me. I was in 101st Air, Airborne. I was a commander in um, Kosovo and in, in a certain SEAL. part of Kosovo. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, was, and in yeah, Bosnia. You're probably commanding yeah. my guys. <laughs> yeah, probably, probably. Um, and and um, uh, they, you know, we, we um, Wes Clark, and you know, Bosnia, West Clark and Bill Clinton. You know, I, I said on the news two years ago, where are West Clark and Bill Clinton when you need them? Because they <laughs> locked everybody in the in the room in Dayton, Ohio, slid pizzas under the door and Diet Cokes and said, come out when you have a deal. And they had a deal and they created a zone of separation. They pushed people apart. And, you know, everybody was a little upset with the deal, but everybody kind of liked the deal. And we can get there from from here. But you know, it's anathema to talk about ceding any terrain to Russia, even though Obama did it. And Obama is like the genius of the left. So you, you, you just can't get there from here. We're just going to continue. And that's the frustrate. There's two really frustrate, frustrating points of view here. One is that what I'm talking about, there's just the, the lack of diplomacy. Maybe yes. it's incompetence. Maybe it's deliberate. Maybe it's a little bit of both. Um and 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 the lack of an end state that is reasonable right and so that's one thing um and, and you know at, at the end of the day the you know this this conflict um has has to manifest itself it, it has to be resolved in some way and and fanning the flames of of uh, you know these the share you know putin's gonna blitzkrieg across europe that, that that's just not going to happen. He's not no. capable of doing that. And and we can have some some uh, you know F thirty fives up in the air that can just you know yeah. knock out his entire thing. And you know if he if he breaches any part of NATO, um, you know I, I think I think I think we're pretty good, right? That's and, what it was and, designed uh, for. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. And we've you know we've been rotating brigade. You know I do think this rotational you know we've been ro rotating airborne brigades into poland and romania and lithuania and all of that and and you know just kind of going going down that road of flexible to turn options is what they're called i think yeah. i think that's a good thing you know just to demonstrate the show of force to you know, and all of that um uh but you know this lack of diplomacy is just um uh, I, you know, I can't figure it out why, why they, you know, they just don't, I guess they don't want it to end uh, well, because yeah, they that's... know they it's unreasonable, Rob, to think that, oh, Ukraine is going to mount a counteroffensive and, and retake Crimea. It's just not going to happen. No, 
No, it's not. Yeah, I don't, mean, you know, we you mentioned the Marshall Plan, and we've spent more in Ukraine than we did on the entire Marshall Plan. You know, rebuilding Europe after mm -hmm. World War II, and when you know, whenever people like Nancy Pelosi, who is married to the greatest stock predictor in the history of stocks, <laughs> yeah, um, right. whenever she's all pro-war. What the fuck is going on monetarily for you? That's I, that's why I think. Right. I mean, even with the fear that the media is putting into a, uh, the left buys the people who watch MSNBC believe it that he takes Ukraine, he's taking Poland. I say bullshit first of all because Poland's got a long memory and they're full of tough people. I don't think that's happening. Plus, we mentioned NATO. NATO's designed to fight that. We don't need to sit there with drones and trench warfare when we have have the the the, the stuff we do. But I mean. I see the problem is I don't think Russia can lose. I don't think they're capable of losing Ukraine and they're not going to. And that if and when they win, that's a loss for NATO, don't you think? Or what do you think? Yeah, I I, I think um I don't disagree with you that you know Putin's just gonna keep going um within Ukraine. I, I don't uh and, and and I'm not inside anybody's mind here. I I don't see the strategic advantage unless Biden's still president and and him going into other Baltic right. states or or you know the um, Romania and you know the southern states um Bulgaria etc um I I I just there you know what's what's the at what cost you know his real his real effort in Ukraine is about energy resources in a, in a yes. port another another port it's an economic thing, like most wars, right? It's all about, you know, resource acquisition, yeah. and and uh, I don't think I don't I don't believe that Putin has these. He may he may talk kind of like Saddam Hussein talking about having chemical weapons when he didn't, yeah. but you know he he may bluster and and all of that, but um, and and you know I'm no Putin apologist. I, I you yeah. know I think. You know, I I think I think he needs to be held accountable for all of this, and mm -hmm. you know, uh, Zelensky is no saint either. Uh, you know, but the I I I do believe that there's a deal to be made somewhere, and it just astounds me that um, yeah. it's been couched. You know, that's why this building. You know, it's like. If you don't fund the Ukraine war, you'll get impeached. You know that last bill that came, yeah. and it was it was like, come on, that's you can't even you're you're not even supposed to write bills like that, like mm -hmm. endless fund for Ukraine war. Uh, you got to have diplomacy. I always think in foreign policy and diplomacy, information, military, economic. The the thing that Trump did best, in my opinion, when he was president, was uh, to manage those levers of power in such a way that we weren't always leading with the chin of the American soldier, sailor, airman, or Marine mm -hmm. economic warfare, information, warfare, diplomacy. Uh, and then of course, military, like in Syria, when they use chemical weapons and, and we did, you know, those very limited strikes, you know, those, all that made sense to me. And, and it projected the right image of America that we were, we're judicious with combat power, and we used all of all of our other levers of national power that um, a, a wealthy nation like the United States has in abundance. And and so, um, but now, I mean, this divide and conquer strategy Biden has is is uh, is is really um, I, I, he's destroying the country intentionally. I think. Yeah, I'm I'm on board with that too. I think you know I might maybe a good way for Putin to uh, negotiate is say he'll stop at the river and then he'll he'll just work on making his navy greener. Maybe that'll maybe that'll get because that seems like the, the apparently all the bullshit we've covered today. The biggest threat is after all climate change. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. So if he if he puts an EV um army into ukraine then it may be everything that's i, I had never thought of that that's it's actually a good <laughs> plot for my next book there you go I, I, i'll co i'll yeah. co-author it with you if you don't mind and there you go we should we should do I, that i wanted to end on a on a happier note um because yeah. i think we we covered a lot i'm pretty they you know sit us in a room with pizza i think we'd figure a lot of this out <laughs> but um right. uh, um you mentioned working for lloyd austin and the pentagon and i've always said like the because the pentagon was designed for world war ii and then 
like anything, it just gets bigger and bigger. It's not going to go away, even though they right. say it was. Right. It's like the same thing in Afghanistan. Like we're going to leave, um, and we they've already given the Taliban since we've left two point nine billion dollars, which isn't a lot for us because we just print money. You know, we got a, a trillion dollars mm. every hundred days and all that shit. Um, but at the Pentagon, which we used as enlisted guys, we used to call the five sided wind tunnel. Just like, <laughs> but um, all right. Uh, what? Because I I make a joke when I talk about because I'm enlisted, I'm allowed to. Um, at, at what, at what rank is it? Cause I always say when, when you stop carrying your own luggage, you should just be a civilian. You don't need to be the military. At what rank is it? Is it, is it like Lieutenant Colonel where someone else is carrying your shit or how does that work? <laughs> um, I, I went, once I made, um, Brigadier General, um, I, I think so. I, I got an aide de camp who was carrying, well, so great story. Um, I should have kept carrying my own shit. Um, <laughs> the, the, uh, uh, so I'm in Afghanistan as a deputy commanding general of all the troops there in uh, 2006. And uh, Colonel Ed Reeder um, and I are standing there in the Joint Operations Center looking at the Jumbotron. And uh, I'm, I'm directing um, drones and aircraft onto some Taliban that had attacked one of our new outposts in uh, Sangin, Helmand Province, along yeah. the Helmand River, and a uh, big-time poppy area. And Ad Reader says to me, um, hey, sir, what are two alpha males like us doing here watching TV? Why don't we go down there? You know, we were in Bagram, so it was like, you know, a flight to Kandahar and then a flight to <laughs> to out to Helmand. And and like, like, like a dumbass, I said, yeah, that's a good idea. And so we fly down there um, and then get on a helicopter and we actually, the sun's starting to come up now. We had some casualties and, you know, we did what leaders do. And you spend time talking to your troops. Uh, we lick our wounds a little bit. I spent the day, there was a special forces, a team, Vermont national guard, and then Afghan national army folks, um, in, in a pretty intense fight. And we killed a whole bunch of them and, and, uh, the bad guys. And, uh, so as we're leaving, um, the sun's about to go down. My helicopter's coming in to get us. The There's four people standing in the poppy field, me, Colonel Reeder, his radio guy, and my radio guy. And and um, his radio guy says, hey, sir, uh, uh, we just got an intercept that there's a sniper across the Hellman River with instructions to shoot the one without the rifle. And so I, <laughs> I look at... I look at Ed Reader, he's got his, I always carried a rifle. I look at Ed, he, he's got his rifle. I look at his guy, he's got his rifle. I look at my guy, he's got his rifle. And I look down and, and Ed Reader, being Ed Reader, um, spits some tobacco juice into the poppy field and grins and says, sir, it looks like you're about to have a bad day. And, <laughs> and uh, I'm like, Fuck you, Colonel. Give me <laughs> this is a direct order. Give me that rifle. And, and he said, he said, this is what I'm gonna disobey. And yes. um, so and and so we started doing the matrix thing a little bit, you know, moving around. And I don't know if he took the shot or not, but you know, all all of us made it and the helicopter came in, we got out of there just fine. But point being, always carry your own shit. That's that's a brilliant story. <laughs> No, that's, that's perfectly <laughs> pleased. And it's almost funny, too, that the enemy knew who the highest-ranking dude was. He's not carrying yep, this shit. Yep, yep, yep that's, exactly. Well, that, you know, back to Afghanistan and officers and enlisted stuff, this this still to this day is hilarious because uh, um, a lot of the vets from there around the August 2021, the debacle, hitting the bottle heavy, drinking a lot. And I was on Twitter, and I'm just shit-talking, whatever. And, I, you know, wake up the next day, and I'm like, oh, man, I got to do it with a, a, a general somewhere. And I, kind of, I felt bad. I'm like, this is obviously a great dude. And I'm talking shit. I hit you up and I said something. And you said, oh, he says anything. You tell him I said to fuck right off. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that was the other point I was going to make is that, like, while Afghanistan is imploding, while Ukraine is imploding, while Hamas, you know, does what all these generals, like, uh, you know, that are like uh, on the left side, you know, CNN analysts and all of that. Mm -hmm. They're all explaining away Biden's brilliance for what's there. But imagine if it were Trump, you know, they they would be like all over. Oh, he's yeah. incompetent. You know, everybody works for him. And and so you think of the corruption of these people that serve their country in uniform. Yeah. And I, I grant them that. But the corruption 
of their of their uh, intellect to be able to do the mental gymnastics that it was okay what happened in Afghanistan or it was Trump's fault or that it's okay to offer Zelensky a ride out and decapitate the Ukrainian government or, or that it's okay that Hamas came in and did what they did and, and we should, you know, uh, back off and it's okay to try to strong arm Israel into not destroying Hamas. Mm. I mean, give yeah. me a break. So, yeah, I'm glad I told you that. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think it's I guess, the, a lot of a lot of veterans uh, realize that the the army has been underpaying them for I get a paycheck. Like, all right, I'm, I'll say whatever you want. This is not too bad. <laughs> can, all right, can, right, right. Can you uh, can tell us a little bit about Garrett Sinclair? Because I want to I want to pump the, the famous code. The book's awesome. Yeah, I haven't finished like I said, but I uh, tell us about him. The 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 uh, a little bit about the the hero and where they can find the book. And I'm telling everyone to read this book. Yeah. The, the book is everywhere. Books are sold. Amazon, Barnes and Noble and indie bookstores uh, go to ajtata.com. My, my website, you got links to everything there. Uh, this is the third in a series with uh, Macmillan, St. Martin's press um, and, and the Garrett Sinclair series. You know, I, I was with Kensington books for many years and I, then I started co-writing some books with Nick Irving, the Army Ranger sniper, and and uh, you know Mark Resnick, my editor at Macmillan, um, said Tony, let's do a, a solo deal. Uh, and and uh, my agent said, hey, give me give me you know you're a general, give me a general, give you know give me that authentic general voice. Mm-hmm. And you know so like my previous hero Jake Mahegan and my Kindling books that you know got a you know huge following. Um, he was a loner, former Delta guy, Native American from the Outer Banks of North Carolina. Sinclair, as a paratrooper, special ops guy, he's a commander of JSOC in the, in the first book in this series. And he has a special team called Dagger Team, and where he reports directly to the president to do presidentially directed missions. And in the story, his wife was college roommates with who is now the president, Kim Campbell. And so he's very close with the president, but they have a very testy relationship and they have a special set of cell phones that they communicate with. And that's where he gets his missions from. And so Sinclair um, and the, and the phalanx code um, is co-opted by I think Elon Musk uh, looking for someone to help protect his developers, uh, and you know, developing is is uh, to get the right people to write code and write the right kind of code. That's a very rare talent, and and uh, the Phalanx Corporation is coming after the Elon Musk like company to kill all of their developers to take down that last wall of free speech. And I wrote this before Musk bought Twitter, and and. And so what, what you have is that Sinclair, um, you know, the, the Mitch Drusen is the Elon Musk equivalent, helps resource um, uh, Sinclair breaking out of prison. And his old team comes back together. Awesome. Um, all of my books, all of, I, I have my threat series, my Mahegan series. And I kept getting email, man, I love Mahegan. Why, why don't you have Mahegan? And so Jake Mahegan comes back in a big way. In phalanx code and I, I you know i don't know if you've seen the reviews but everybody's like loving jake coming back because you know a lot of people really love that character in that oh, series yeah. and and i and i bring back hobart and van dreams and all the former delta guys that um were teammates with with um you know, every everybody there and so and now they're on a mission to protect the little guy the the elon musk developers against the phalanx corporation the phalanx code they believe is the kill list Mm -hmm. of all the developers and so they have coders and or or hackers uh cryptologists trying to break the code uh and they can't and so um uh, sinclair has to go to uh france to find um evelyn champion who uh, great grandfather uh, decoded the actually decoded the Rosetta Stone, so I create this fictional great granddaughter named Evelyn, um, and she has all the linguistic and decoding and cryptology skills of 
of of the guy who decoded the Rosetta Stone, and and he and he goes and finds her, and 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 then um, a a family secret from his grandfather, who was the first Garrett Sinclair. Garrett Sinclair the third is the protagonist in all these books, and and they're all West Point grads, and so they, you know there's a lot of pressure. There's all all that comes into play, and he learns about a you know a, a family secret about his grandfather who scaled the cliffs. The first chapter in the book is the grandfather scaling Point to Hawk with right, the Rangers. Normandy, yeah, wow, yeah, and if and if you notice the book, there's this rhombus here and on every chapter is the ranger rhombus uh right. so you see you see that and that's the that's ranger cool. patch very cool. from from uh world war ii and and it all of that comes into play and um you know i'm getting a lot of uh texts and emails and and calls saying it's the best thing i've ever written and, that's awesome uh, uh and and i you know, I really put my heart and soul in it because I didn't know every book, Rob. I don't know if it's my last book or not because yeah. you go in in the <laughs> fiction world, and unless, unless you're Jack Carr or or Brad Thor or or Mark Graney, you're you're living by two to three book contracts, right? And mm -hmm. and um, uh, so you know, and I mean, my books do well. I do well with the uh, you know the the publishers, and and um, I feel like I tell good stories. So um, yeah. And I really appreciate the opportunity to chat about it with uh, you and your. No, that's your that's viewers. awesome. Again, too, uh, it's going to take me a minute to uh, to read it just because uh, my my baby Valor <laughs> is here, and I'm going to have to go see her. Oh but, uh, wow, what an awesome name! Congratulations. Yeah, we we were leaving we were leaving um, one of the uh, one of the but when Jessica was pregnant, we saw a sign that said "In Valor, there is hope," and it just kind of stuck. So I thought it was fitting, and it's unique. So that's good. And uh, yeah, like I said, I'm going to finish it up. I will be in touch with you and let you know uh, um, how I, I, I'm going to tell you right now, having not finished it, I have faith in the Delta guys. I, I've seen them work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, they all, they all, um, uh, it, it's an interesting read. It's a good read. Cool. And uh, I think I, I provide enough twists and turns, but I, 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 I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Well, General Tata, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Rob, and uh, best best uh, luck to you and your your home team family and uh, little Valor. I, I'm Thank you. Very very happy for you guys. Wow, I mean, rarely am I at a loss for words. That I mean, that story is amazing. Um, I'm I can't wait to finish the the Phalanx Code. What what an what an outstanding book. What a great guy. I mean, that story is incredible. Uh, it, it, let you know get get the book, buy the book. Let me know what you think of it. It's just uh. I generally don't. I don't have a, a hard time concluding podcasts, but uh, just I love the humility. Humility is a great. Uh, it's a great trait to have, and I just love how General Tata was writing uh, writing the books. Now we mentioned, well, you know, there's some JSOC guys, some Delta guys, and whatever. So, and I I couldn't help but be remiss and say, I think I know how it's going to end because uh, I've worked with uh, the D boys before. I've worked with JSOC before. I've worked with the Army, the Army before. And I have nothing but faith. <clears throat> so if, um, yeah, man, just stay on the side of the D-Boys. And, and if you realize and remember that uh, in Valor there is hope, you're never out of the fight.